Hi, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcin and Stefano, for your kind invitation. And thank you, Valeria, for your generous presentation. Um, basically, I prepared a PowerPoint and I'm going to, to share my screen with you. Yes, here we are. Okay. Um, the presentation I will give you today is mainly divided into big sections. In the first one, I will present what the Zolicon seminars are, how they were born, and what, they, what teams they address. In the second section, I will show what team we can directly and indirectly draw on by Heidegger's Zolicon seminars, and more in general, by ES meditation. Oh, before entering in details in this presentation, I find important to offer you a clarification. We cannot understand Heidegger's contribution to mental health sciences, uh, sweeping under the carpet themes coming from metaphysics and ontology. This is why I will make some references to these themes along the way, since they are the pathways for many concepts we will encounter. So let's start with the first big section. What are the Zolicon seminars? Under the title of Zolicon seminars, we have two books. A first one, edited by Medard Boss in 1987 for the publishing house the Klostermann Verlag, but not included in the corpus of Heidegger's collected works, the so-called Gesamtausgabe and another one headed by Peter Travny in 2018 for the publishing house the Klostermann Verlag and included in Heidegger's Gesamtausgabe as volume 89. These two volumes substantially differ. While the first one is the collection of protocols and seminars written and transcribed by Boss and some participants, and a selection of letters between Boss and Heidegger, the second one is the collections of notes written by Heidegger himself in preparation of the Zolicon seminars, and as such, they can be considered as work notes. In the frame of this presentation, I will refer to the English translation of the Zolicon seminars, edited by Medard Boss. The Zolicon seminars are a series of seminars delivered between 1959 and 69 in front of an audience of doctors, psychiatrists and analysts. While the first seminar held on September 8, 1959 was in the auditorium of the Burgosli Clinic at the University of Zurich, from the second one till the last one, they were hosted in the house of Dr. Medard Boss in Zollikon, a municipality in the canton of Zurich in Switzerland. Each year, Heidegger devoted his time and energy to lecture in front of 50 to 70 participants within Boss House, two to three times each semester. He spent three hours, two evenings a week with a guest. After each lecture, a debate followed. This seminar were a testament to one of Heidegger's strongest hope, that there is the possibility to inaugurate a dialogue between the so-called method of thinking, what he calls Besinnung, and medicine, a dialogue that was able to educate physicians in a non-metaphysical way, and we will see shortly what this expression means. In the context of Zolico seminars, all the participants had a varying amount of philosophical education. How the Zollican seminars are born? They are born from a friendship between the philosopher Heidegger and the psychiatrist Boss. Their encounter happened in 1947, when Mather the Boss struggled with Heidegger's magnus opus, B and Time. In the introduction on, in, of the English edition of Zollican seminars, Boss admits that he did not understand no one of its content. So he decided to take courage and write a letter to the philosopher. As he recalls, as a doctor, I wrote a letter to the philosopher and asked for some help in reflective thinking. I was very surprised when an answer arrived by written email. 
In it, Martin Heidegger agreed in a friendly way to give me any help he could. Along the years, they exchanged 256 letters by the time of Heidegger's death and over 50 greeting cards from his trip abroad. As soon as the border between Germany and Switzerland was possible, they began to make regular personal visits and return visits to each other's home. With the boss words, during our first meeting of Martin Heidegger's Munten Hut in Tutnauberg in the summer of 1949, a mutual human sympathy developed between us. It gradually grew into a cordial friendship. I'd like also to recall that the first trip abroad for Heidegger and his wife was with the boss family in Sicily. If the friendship between Heidegger and Boss is among the main reasons of these seminars, there is also a private reason. In 1946, Heidegger's sofa mental breakdown. He was hospitalized in the clinic Schlosshaus Baden in Baden Weiler, a small village located 40 kilometers in the south of Freiburg in Breisgau, where he was treated by Dr. Emin von Gebsart. Heidegger's stay in Baden Weiler lasted from February 1946 to the end of May. After the hospitalization, his psychotherapeutic treatment continued with von Gebsartel. Along the years, Heidegger and von Gebsartel became friends. On the occasion of von Gebsartel's 17th birthday, Heidegger gave lecture at Würzburg University in his honor, later published in 1958 in the special issue of the journal Jahrbuch für Psychologie und Psychotherapie, dedicated to the work of von Gebsartel. Heidegger's contribution to this first Schrift was entitled Basic Principles of Thinking. Somehow, Heidegger's own experience of mental health impacted his consideration of healthcare sciences and shaped along the years his consideration of psychotherapy and psychiatry. As Boss recalls, Heidegger saw the possibility that his philosophical insight would not be confined merely to the, philosoph to the philosopher's quarters, but also might benefit many more people, especially people in need of help. The Zolikon seminars are very rich and for some aspects also complicated. For this reason, I find important that a possible reader becomes familiar with the Heidegger's thinking before surfing into this book. Among the many important elements, the book addresses, there are at least four points that I would like to present to you. At the very beginning of the book, we read that the Zollicon seminars were aimed at providing a known metaphysical education to the audience and to discuss until what extent metaphysics found Western medicine. As many of you know, one of the main philosophical concerns for Heidegger was to dismantle the primacy of metaphysics and philosophy and more in general in thinking and acting. Western metaphysics forces all things to be understood within a substance-oriented and dualistic view. Heidegger's critique to metaphysics from 1929 onwards is the Ariane street of his meditation. At the core of his thought lies the issue of being what in German is called a Seinsfrage as the original question of all the Western philosophy. If we want to simplify very, very, very much, we can say that from Plato to Nietzsche, all Western metaphysical thought conceived the being as an entity, as something. For example, the concept of the idea, the substance, the subject, or God. This is sub substance oriented view altered the original Greek thought for which the being was named aletheia or fuses and opened the door to the so-called forgetfulness of being. This metaphysical view culminated in the Cartesian paradigm. The ego cogito affirms the man as the subject mastering and controlling objects in the world. In other words, the ego cogito allows the traditional interpretation of human being as a rational animal, as subject, as I, and so on. In the realm of mental health, the Cartesian paradigm is very welcome. 
the mind-body dualism largely influenced by Cartesian philosophy contributed to the understanding of psychopathological phenomena as brain afflictions. Many of us know how much Carla Jaspers devoted his energy to dismantle this epistemological approach. Heidegger shared, shared with Jaspers this presupposition. The Cartesian legacy combined with the Galilean method generates the modern conception of science, for which measurability and objectivation are synonym of truth. If we take a step back from Heidegger and go to see what happened at the end of 17th century, we see that science at the time built a paradigm of truth in terms of measurability, calculations and projections. Fostering that view, only what can be proved through numbers is effective and as such, true. Modern science has changed not only the way we see the world today, there is something we can measure, use, organize or take advantage of. Think, for example, at the natural resources of our planet. But it also has changed the way we see ourselves as human beings. We begin to increasingly see ourselves as something that is made up by parts to be repaired, changed or fixed. And not as a whole. This has been what many influential thinkers, for example, such as Jaspers, Jonas, Marcuse, and Heidegger himself criticized. Heidegger's critique to the modern notion of subjectivity lies in this view. It's not a mere philosophical quibble, but an intervention of how we conceptualize ourselves in the present and make use of science. For over 20 years, and this is the second theme I would like to discuss with you, Heidegger wrote extensively about his critique of science as an important part of his critics of metaphysics. Scientific method is viewed as a manifestation of the relationship scientists have with all the beings in the world. There is grounded on measurability and objectivation, landmarks for a new way of thinking, which is the calculative thinking. Only what can be calculated is worth inquiry, and as such, only what can be measurable would be usable. According to Heidegger, this is one of the results of metaphysics. The principle of quantity dominates all beings. Being an object only makes its appearance in the modern natural science, we read in the Zollicon Seminars. And the metaphysical question of being is no longer capable of taking itself seriously. In a very provocative way, Heidegger adds that this is why contemporary philosophy seeks the favor of sciences and like them finds salvation in what is concrete and proven, which the metaphysical question of being hands over to itself out of the lived experience of beings. The strange striving for a real and realistic ontology is not even the end of metaphysics anymore, but merely the dying away of a phantom which scholarship has produced out of the scholastic form of metaphysics. With the provocative dictum, science does not think in the sense in which thinkers think, Heidegger sought to stress that every natural science rests on presuppositions which cannot be established ontologically. In other words, a science that is capable of thinking in an ontological way would be one which can call into question its ontic presuppositions and conceptualize the ontological meaning of the object of its inquiry. In Zolikon seminars, we can read, for sign, the domain of object is already pre-given. Research go forward in the same direction in which the respective areas have already been talked about pre-scientifically. These areas belong to the everyday world. The prevailing opinion nowadays is that it is as if science alone could provide objective truth. Science is the new religion. On the contrary, ontology demands a different view, one that moves from entities to being. The scientific method inaugurated by modernity has no relationship with truth, but only with exactness. But human being is ontologically different from the results that come from the accuracy of being measured or of being objectified. We can translate this point with a gap, with a gap between the third person approach to mental issue 
and a first person perspective on them. And with the impact of operationalism on a psychiatric descriptions, where for example, there is no room left for patients first person account of their experience. Put with Heidegger's words, according to natural science, the human being can be identified only as something present at end in nature. The question arises, can human nature be found at all in this way? From the projection of the natural sciences, we can see that human being only as an entity of nature. But the question still remains whether something human will result, something which relates to the human being as a human being. According to Heidegger, the nature of human being cannot be grasped neither by natural sciences nor by metaphysical thinking. This is why it is required a leap into the so-called meditative thinking. What is the meditative thinking, the Besinnung that Heidegger is trying to explain? It's not an anthropology, not a kind of a psychoanalysis. Rather, it's a phenomenological enterprise, the effect of which may also serve in therapeutic practices, empathing both the doctor and the patient. This enterprise begins with the analysis of human beings' existence inaugurated in BN time and lies in the possibility to understand existence in a non-naturalistic, neither Cartesian way. In fact, since existence cannot be reduced to a series of behaviors regarded from the point of view of elemental causal interactions, it requires a different approach that can be summarized in a formula of sorts from homo natura to homo existentia. It is in beyond time that we find a fundamental indication of this. Existence has something to do with the way through which human being has to be. It means with a certain modus ascendi. Here we enter into the field of ontology. If we try to simplify a very complicated debate on the ontological nature of existence, we can say that Heidegger uses the notion of displacement to provide a certain meaning of this modus ascendi. He displaces human being from the solid ground of metaphysical arena for which the being is always regarded as present to the uncertain field of possibility. Put it differently, Man is no longer the main character of the metaphysical discourse, rather is replaced in the peripheral regions of the world. The displacement of human being from metaphysical central position to a peripheral one involves the reassessment of what we define as entity and its relationship with every different form of entity. If we trace this team back to Heidegger's essay entitled Identity and Difference, we can understand how his meditation jeopardizes the Western understanding of, sub of the subject. What is required to dismantle the primacy of the metaphysical conception of being as presence in favor of the revealing of the being is a shift of paradigm, that is, from a substantial ontology to a model one, in which the condition of possibilities of entities can lead to the right interrogation of the question of being and after to a proper definition of existence. So when we approach the concept of meditative thinking of Besinnung, we should bear in mind that more than presence regarded according to metaphysics, Heidegger is interested in the possibility as the real feature of existence. The famous sentence in being in time means exactly this, higher than actuality stands possibility. The meditative thinking that does not consider measurability as the original constitution of medicine, since truth and validity are different concepts that define different things. While natural science is in search of validity and reliability, grounded only on measurability, meditative thinking is in search of truth, which may also be translated as meaning. The hermeneutic phenomenological approach of Heidegger tells us, for example, that mental phenomena are not product of isolated intrapsychic mechanism, and that the human being cannot be subdivided into parts, one that is a part of nature and the other the more central one that is not a part of nature. For how could two such heterogeneous things be brought together and be mutually influenced by each other? 
But what are the themes addressed in the Zolicon seminars? They are enormously different. Heidegger discussed topics such as the notion of being in Kant, and the issue of space and temporality, the difference between a causality and a motivation, the Galilean method, the phenomenological critic to the distinction between psyche and soma, the issue of care, cybernetic, the legacy of Cartesian philosophy and the legacy of psychotherapy, the role of Befindlichkeit and many, many, many other themes. This is why at the very beginning of this presentation, I claimed, well, before approaching the Zolikon seminar, it's important that one is familiar with Heidegger meditation in its totality. Among these huge panorama of themes, I would like to briefly discuss Heidegger's critique to Biswanger's design analysis and to offer a comparison with both application of this method. We encountered this topic in the fifth seminar, um, which took place in March 8, 1965. With the expression design analysis um, or design analyse, I refer to the phenomenological and existential approach to mental health that was developed by Ludwig Biswanger at the end of the 20s. Only after World War II, Mather de Bos starts to use the word design analytique to differentiate his approach from Biswanger variant. However, both Biswanger and Bos develop an existential phenomenological approach toward mental health based on Martin Heidegger's philosophy. Unfortunately, this is not the occasion to retrace this Wanger encounter with Heidegger and to go in details of his use of the Gerian concept. What I find important is to stress the difference between these two approaches, the one proposed by Biswanger and the other proposed by Bos. In fact, while for Bos the emphasis of the design analytique was on the ontological level of the world, regarded as the possibility for each being to show itself as being, for Biswanger the world was characterized as a specific quantic ways in which the individual is in the world. Biswanger's phenomenological analysis concerns a person's world design, but this design is not the answer to a person's experience or to history. It is an existential a priori that underlines experience and history. Biswanger's work was aimed to use the Heideggerian existential analysis as, as Biswanger himself claimed, as an anthropological type of scientific investigation. There is one which is aimed on the essence of being human. What was the reactions of Heidegger? Well, it was vehemently disregarded to Biswanger's approach of design analysis uh, because, among many other things, Biswanger did not see, according to Heidegger, the ontological dimension of human beings. He conflated the ontological with the everyday level of existence, missing the ontological difference, developing a kind of philosophical anthropology on a merely everyday and subjective level. On the contrary, he saw Boss with a full appreciation for his work and for his use of fundamental ontology, especially um, underlying how Boss was able to conceive humans as a receptive, perceptive word, openness being, in their relationship with the alterity. However, despite the differences of these two approaches, the design analysis is still a method of therapy, mainly known as existential therapy, and it received an official institutionalization. Around the 70s, Boss and his pupil John Condrau founded the Swiss Society of Design Analysis and later the Zurich Institute of Design Analytic Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics. In 1984, the Swiss Professional Federation for Design Analysis was founded in Zurich and among the pivotal figures of the contemporary design analysis approach, I would like to mention Dr. Alice holtzai -Kunz. Now. Let's move to the second section of this presentation. What we can directly and indirectly draw on by Heidegger's Zollicon seminars and more in general by his meditation. I've highlighted four points, very dense. The first one is related to mental illnesses. Regarded 
not as an alteration of patient's live experience, rather as a conflict between a patient's and the meaning of life and their purpose. The meaning-making process is cardinal in understanding why and how the so-called disruptions happen in people's life, changing the form of existence they live. If we go to beyond time, we can read. Only design can be meaningful or meaningless. That is to say, its own being and the entities disclosed with its being can be appropriated in understanding or can remain rele relegated to a known understanding. As recognized by Viktor Frankl and Ludwig Biswangers, Heidegger's design analysis has the merit of having contributed to a new, un to a new understanding of psychosis. The science analysis needs to focus on the unity of being the world, and this unity must be analyzed into the dimensional multiplicity of existence and facticity. According to Biswanger, Heidegger has elucidated the structure of subjectivity as transcendence, a clarification that had important consequences in the interpretation of psychosis. With the word of Biswanger, we realize that by investigating the structure of being in the world, we can also approach and explore a psychosis, understanding them as specific modes of transcendence. A second aspect uh, that I would like to underline with you of the Zollicon seminar is the analysis of Dasein, which is a pretty problematic concept. Mm at the very beginning of the dialogue that someone can have with Heidegger. Um, the analysis of Dasein is not confined to be in time, rather it extends into other works such as what is metaphysics, the fundamental concept of metaphysics, the basic problem of phenomenology, the Zollicon seminars and many other books. Now, how can we place the Dasein in the landscape of Heidegger's meditation and in relation to mental health issues? This issue may also be put differently. As does a body, a sex, a gender? The answer is no. In Heidegger's words, despite its bodily nature, Dasein is regarded as neutral and asexual, insofar as it exists prior to and makes possible an understanding of sexed body and gendered practices. Dasein is not to be understood in terms of everyday human existence or embodied agency, but as a space of meaning that is already there. This is the meaning of the little word da in Dasein. Prior to the emergence of the human body in its various capacity. From being time, we can read, the da in being time does not mean a statement of place of a being, but rather it should designate the openness where beings can be present for the human being and the human being also for himself. Heidegger insists that Dasein is not to be interpreted as a concrete subject. Uh, for example, if we think about the Sartrean account of the Etrela, Dasein is there prior to the practical involvement of the subject and its first feature is to have to be. In other words, themes such as body, life, consciousness, cardinal in the phenomenological investigation are possible only on the basis of Dasein. In this regard, fundamental ontology is the requirement for every day, for, for every phenomenological investigations. Heidegger careful analysis of the basic structures of Dasein, such as uh, disposition, language, understanding, the issue of care and its relationship with temporality, the role of moods, the examination of fear and anxiety, just to mention some themes, are elements that can be seen as a compass for each practitioner. If existence has to do with the way to be each of us choose, then every variation of the regional and solo-ontic structure that characterizes existence and all its expressions need to be scrutinized in a non-objectivistic way, which means to overcome a certain biological approach grounded on reductionism and neuromania. Heidegger repeated many times in the frame of the Zollicon seminars that the ontological level and the ontic level cannot be separated as different 
pieces of the machines. Rather, they are intertwined in a, in a reciprocal relationship. Another key concept uh, for the issue of Dasein is uh, the notion of befindlicit disposition, a concept that we find in uh, paragraph 29 of chapter 5, section 1 of BN Time. Befindlichkeit first appears in Heidegger's work as a translation of the Aristotelian notion of diathesis, which means disposition. Befindlichkeit as an a priori component of the science facticity disclosed the theoretical level of existence and expressed the fact that human beings are always situated into moods. These moods are the background to all specifically directed intentional states, and that is close the possibility of encountering the content of our experience and of our thought. Through moods, we are attuned to the world and we can search for meanings. Befindlichkeit works mainly on two levels. On one hand, he shows how Dasein is essentially always disclosed to the world, to the others and to entities. On the other hand, he shows how Dasein is always oriented oriented toward an ecstatic dimension, an original openness, both in the ontological structure and in its ontic manifestations. A third theme that I would like briefly to discuss with you is the body. Uh, apparently a missed character in a Heidegger's meditation. But if we read the Zollikon seminars, we discover a different perspective. Referring to B and time, Heidegger states that the bodily is the most difficult problem to understand. At the time of B and time, I quote, I was unable to say more at the time. In B and time, Heidegger clarifies that Dasein cannot be understood as a kind of corporal thing, but despite this, Dasein is in its nature bodily. In the lecture on Nietzsche, Heidegger rejects the dominant naturalistic interpretation of the human body as corpa. And there, in those lectures, we can read, we do not have a body in the way we carry a knife in a sheath. Neither is the body another body that merely accompanies us and which can establish expressly or not as being also at hand. We do not have a body, rather we are bodily. Our being embodied is essentially other than merely being encumbered with the organism. Most of what we know from natural sciences about the body and the way it embodies are specifications based on the established misinterpretation of the body as a mere natural body. Everything we call our bodiliness, down to the last muscle fiber and down to the most hidden molecular of hormones, already belongs essentially to existing. It is precisely in Zollicon seminars that Heidegger says something important on a certain notion of embodiment. And here I found this quote particularly brilliant. When you have back pains, are they of a special nature? What kind of speciality is peculiar to the pain spreading across your back? Can it be equated to the surface extension of a material thing? The defunction of pain has certainly exhibits the character of extension, but it does not involve a surface. Of course, one can also examine the body as a corporal thing, because you are educated in anatomy and physiology as doctors, that is, with a focus on examination of bodies, you probably look at the state of the body in a different way than the layman does. Yet a layman's experience is probably closer to the phenomenon of pain, as it involves our bodily lines, even if can hardly be described with the aid of our usual intuition of space. The body, for Heidegger, understood phenomenologically, is not a corporal thing present at end. Rather, it is actively directed toward the world. And with the expression, bodying forth on the body, Heidegger is talking about the bodily intentionality, this kind of central and cardinal concept that we will meet in Merleau-Ponty phenomenology of perception. In Zalikon seminars, we can read, the difference between the limits of the corporal thing and the body 
consists in the fact that the bodily limit is extended beyond the corporal limit. Thus, the difference between the limits is a quantitative one. But if we look at the matter in this way, we could misunderstand the very phenomenon of the body and of body limit. The bodily limit and the corporal limit are not quantitative, but rather qualitatively different from each other. Therefore, the limit of the body and forth changes constantly through the change in the reach of my sojourn. The role that the body plays in Adegar's meditation is not prioritizing, but at the same time it is a harbinger of crucial step for the development of followers' theories of embodiment. As Kevin Howe has brilliantly underlined, Heidegger acknowledged that the human body belongs to both health and word. As material, earthly beings, we inhabit a specific sex, have a unique neurological, hormonal and skeletical signature and are capable of certain kinds of physiological movements, gestures and sound, our corporeal attributes are made meaningful through our engagement in a shared social historical situation. The body, in this regard, is more than encapsulated, dermal roping that houses organs, bones and blood. The body is, the body is always ecstatic surpassing the limit of its own skin, and so far it is already shaping and being shaped by the word. Now, my question is, how can we use this Edgarian toolbox, which is very complicated? I'm going to answer this question offering you three examples, and then I will move to the conclusions. The first example is uh, offered by um, a work of Louis Sass entitled Heidegger's Schizophrenia uh, and the Ontological Difference, um, a pretty old paper that um, it was the first step in a very long journey take by Sass. Uh, he used the Heideggerian notion of ontological difference, which offers a phenomenological reading of a certain central aspect of the schizophrenic experience. Sass argues that both hallucinations and delusions in schizophrenic patients usually seems to be embedded in a context that is quite different from the common sense world of everyday pragmatic understanding. The tendency to forget this and to focus instead on aspect of the content of such symptoms can be understood as resulting from a failure to be sensitive to the distinction between being and beings, what Heidegger called the ontological difference. As better understanding of the word of schizophrenic, delusion depends on what might be called a, a thinking of the difference, or what Heidegger described as the possibility of negotiating the passage from the ontic consideration of beings to the ontological thematization of being. Another example is offered by the work of Matthew Ratcliffe on moods, emotion, and feelings, a clear example of a certain use of the Edgarian tools in the field of psychopathological phenomena and neuroscience. In particular, his work entitled Heidegger's Attunement and the Neuropsychology of Emotion outlines the early Heidegger views on mood and emotion and relates its central claims to some recent findings in neuropsychology. Through the analysis of Damasio's work and his discussion of the, of the neurology of emotion, Radcliffe shows how mood is something that determines the way in which the word is opened up for explicit deliberation. Moods and emotion are neither cognitive in the traditional sense, nor mere affect, but, as Heidegger uh, already thought, a background, they are a background that bend us to the world, hankering us to a contest of goals, projects, and relevant patterns. Moods and emotion constitute a sense of belonging, a passing feeling of orientation, without which explicit cognition cannot occur. The psychological phenomena and their neurological correlates that the master describes cannot be accommodated within a traditional view that allocates cognitive primacies to detached theoretical intentionalities. Indeed, they are called for better with the Edgarian conception of moods and emotion. 
A last example I would like to offer you is the work of Robert Stollero on trauma. In his two books, Trauma and Human Existence, Autobiographical, Psychoanalytic and Philosophical Reflection, published in 2007, and World Affectivity and Trauma, published, published in 2011, Stollero shows how the essence of emotional trauma lies in the shattering of what he calls the absolutism of everyday life. The system of illusory beliefs that allows us to function in the world experience a stable, predictable and safe. Such, such shattering is a massive loss of innocence, exposing the inescapable contingency of, of existence. Emotional trauma brings us face to face with our finitude and existential vulnerability with death and with the loss of possibility as they define our existence. As Tolero pointed out, the ecstatic unity of temporality is devastatingly disturbed by the experience of emotional trauma. Experience of trauma become a frame phrased into an eternal present in which one remains forever trapped, or to which one is condemned to perpetually return. Trauma exposes the human being to the so-called unbearable and badness of being. The words of traumatized people is fundamentally incommensurable with those of others. I'm going to, to strive to the conclusion. How can Heidegger's meditation provide a significant contribution in the field of medical care? Bearing in mind that his competences in clinical practice were completely absent, I argue that his work on fundamental structure of Dyson may help professionals in the field of mental health in offering a new approach to understanding the human being, its vulnerability, and the possibility of recovery. Heidegger's analysis of dualistic approach to health in general and mental health in particular reveals the risk for health professions in continuing to misinterpret human beings as either a master for subjective consciousness or a quantifiable casual determined object. Heidegger seeks to restore the unity of our being, split us under the Cartesian dualism. His analysis of human being is finalized to see the ontological unit of an articulated multiplicity. There is this quote in the Zollicon seminars that is particularly close to my heart. Heidegger claims, the human being is essentially in need of help because he is always in danger of losing himself and not, of not coming to grips with himself. This danger is connected with the human being's freedom. The entire question of the human being's capacity for being ill is connected with the imperfection of his unfolding essence. Each illness is a loss of freedom, a constriction of the possibility of living. This means that medicine can no longer be reduced to a form of praxis uh, focused on fixing or changing or making people functioning. Rather, it should be understood as a thoughtful enterprise that illuminates existence from the within. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesca, uh, for a very clear a presentation which was uh, more on the philosophical side, uh, probably the most philosophical presentation in our program so far. Uh, and I'm opening the floor uh, for discussion. So please announce yourself uh, if you have a question uh, on the chat, uh, and then uh, we will go in the order of uh, appearance of the question. Uh, Richard wants to ask a question. Richard, please, yes, please Richard, you can just turn I, on your mic and you will pop up. On the I, I have done that. Yeah, good. So thank you. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, yeah, what what it is, what mental illness is on this on this view. And you said one thing at the end, you said it's about a loss of freedom, constriction of the possibilities of being before that I think was in the slide number one was it or what um, um, you talked about wasn't an alteration of lived experience but rather something like a conflict between the self and the meaning of life and 
the, pur well, the purpose of life or the meaning of something like this. I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to think how, how, is this supposed to be like a, is this supposed to tell us what it, what it really means to be mentally ill? Like, does it tell us, if I didn't know, hadn't come across the word mental illness before, for example, is it supposed to tell us how to use it? You know, I mean, one, one thought, is it supposed to be, it's not supposed to be a psychological thought, right? It's supposed to be philosophical, but so for, if I was going to say, so someone's got, um, let's say, an, a phobia of horses. I can see this constrains the possibilities of their being, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand how to put that into the, how to understand what's mentally ill about that in terms of the conflict between self and meaning of life and purpose. Would you be able to talk us through a bit, a, an example, say like, a, I just give a specific phobia. I don't even know if you counts as a mental illness, but you know, let's imagine, or to pick another one, you know, uh, how, how we're to understand what mental illness, the being of mental illness is on this, on this approach and what kind of answer to what kind of question it, it, it is. Um, if one says mental illness is a conflict between the self and the meaning of life. Thank you, Richard, for your question and for being here. Um, we have to start from the consideration that the perspective of the designs and anal analysis um, which is at the core of this anger and broad and both approaches, is fundamentally a philosophical view on things. And this is because Heidegger had no competences, no clinical competences at all to define what a mental illness is. Starting from this assumption, in the slide you refer to, I underline the passage of the search of meaning. Heidegger was very familiar with Viktor Frankl as um, the very well-known Austrian psychiatrist, the founder of the third school of psychoanalysis in Vienna. And uh, both share the conviction that if the possibility is the real ground of our existence, if the, through possibility we are invited to find our design, our way to be, then the search of meaning has to do with this way to be. So rather than provide a definition as mental illness, as perhaps we are used to uh, in terms of more recent of phenomenological scenario, Heidegger is telling us something different. It's telling us the duty of the designer is to find the more authentic possibility to be what he is, it is in terms of structure not in terms of gender identity. And as such, mental illness can arise, might arise when there is a conflict between the more authentic possibility to me and what the society is expected from me, what my environment is expected from me. So it's not providing a definition as such in terms of content of what a mental illness is, rather it's inviting us to see the relationship between possibility and search of meaning so if i'm thank you so if, if i'm frightened of a let's say my fear of a horse kind of really gets in the way of my mm -hmm. my life it's not just a little fear it's something someone wants to call it a mental illness i mean it, is it that i mean that i've there's a more authentic way of being which would be to not be afraid of a horse i mean i, I mean that's what i'm trying to understand um uh or is it that my environment expects me to not be afraid of horses or uh, wait, could, yeah could you uh, I'm not trying to reduce it to psychological phenomenon. I'm trying to understand it as 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 trying to illuminate what is the being of the mental illness, which is the the fear of horses. Let's say. Well, the fear, uh, philosophically speaking, fear is uh, is a fundamental mood uh, which has an object, and as such, you have always fear of something, and as such, uh, the request of meaning for something which have already an object is more problematic as the search of something which is without an object. If I tell you, look, for example, I got a huge fear of bats. And it's not an example. This is me, Francesca, as a huge fear of bats. My fear of bats as a precise ontic structure, a precise ontic object, the bats. How can I provide meaning to this? Probably it doesn't, it, 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 um, 
a, a clinician, a professional informed by the science analytic approach would invite me to scrutinize the meaning of this phobia, the meaning of this fear, and not to be focused on only on the bats as an object of my fear. I don't know if it does make sense to you. It makes sense, but I, I, I feel like it's an answer to a different question, but I'm going to move on, as it were, to let other, others talk now, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, uh, Matthew Broom uh, would like to ask a question. Matthew, are you, uh, are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear Martin. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Francesca. Uh, a great talk. Um, I guess where I was, just, I was just stuck on the kind of chronology of the Heidegger boss relationship, which, as you said, began in, uh, I think, 47, uh, ended in 69, and obviously Heidegger died in, in 76. And where across that period, um, I guess biological psychiatry arguably made a lot of advances in terms of, you know, the first medication for schizophrenia was 1952. Antidepressants followed shortly afterwards. So I'd just be interested in whether you know anything about how Heidegger responded or thought about, uh, I guess, the, the kind of empirical evidence against his theory that um, metaphysics technology did seem to be helping and asylums were being emptied across Europe around, it, around this time. Thank you, Matthew, for your question. Well, uh, I think that perhaps an answer to this question is in the volume of letters that is going to be published between a boss and a Biswanger. Um, and a, it is um, in the Briefausgabe, which is the collected um, brief, uh, the collected letters that Heidegger used to write to his friends. And uh, I think that there, there could be a specific answer to your question. But since uh, we don't have the book now, I try to take the way around. And I'm thinking that perhaps uh, his concern uh, would be on the use of these new drugs uh, of the, yes, perhaps the concern should be about this calculative thinking at the core of the use of some kind of medication. So, um, the topic is pretty tricky, also because uh, if Heidegger and mental health sciences, Heidegger and psychiatry has been scrutinized, Heidegger neuroscience, strictly speaking, has never been addressed. So I think that we can put the answer between the correspondences, which is going to be published, and on the other way, on Heidegger's focus on the, uh, the calculative thinking, the machination, the technology, the influence of technology in our way of being into the world and dealing with our illness. Because before being a diagnosis is our experience, it's a piece of our story. And it is not only the story of our hiddenness, it's the story of our life. So I guess it would be in this middle position. Just say, okay, it's okay to use, but at the same time, paying attention because as we know, the, the technology, the gestell, has this strong, um, strong bad influence on human being because we are not prepared to deal with it. Rather, we are subject to what technology can do to us. So I try to figure out this. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that, you know, uh, medication provides freedom and possibility or enables that or provides some kind of uh, structure to allow that to take place. It can be true also, though, the, 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 the opposite answer. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's a kind of antinomic uh, question because both answers can be true. Uh, medication can fit in providing a real meaning, an effective meaning, but at the same time, they can also... Um, uh, reduce the ability to find our own meaning. Uh, so I, I think both answer can be can be worth. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have a next question by someone whose name I'm, I'm unfortunately unable to pronounce. Uh, about the Zen philosophy. Is this person here? I would like to ask it live or shall I read it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's on the chat. But 
if the person doesn't want to shop, I will read the question to you, Francesca. But you can also see it on the chat if you open that function. In Zen philosophy, we bracket the world and we try to see things as they are there for as they are there, for we can overcome our illness and pain. Could this analysis have any relation with Heidegger analysis of design? Um, at a certain point of his life, Heidegger got in touch with Buddhism and with uh, uh, philosophy coming from, uh, from coming from Asia. So I would say that uh, I have to mention uh, I have to mention a Heidegger um, book entitled uh, Gelassenite. I don't know the English translation. But perhaps it should be uh, not Serenity, but uh, uh, I'm not familiar with the English work of this book. Uh, in the Gelassenite, in this short book, Heidegger says that the proper attitude uh, for an existence fully um, displayed into the region of beings is the possibility of letting things happen. So this letting things happen, this attitude of being in a complete disposal of being things happen means also that we have to accept that pain, suffering, illness are part of this story. So uh, not sure if we have to bracket the word, rather I'm more inclined to say that we are invited to let things happen and to, to embrace, to embody this, this way of living in order to being completely in the openness of the being. I'm trying to translate in, in, in English the, the, the German test I have in mind, so it's pretty difficult. But this is basically the concept of Gelassenite. This uh, over, um, this attitude to a, a constant openness uh, toward the word in the authentic encounter of what the word can, of what the word can offer to me. So not inclined about bracketing, but more inclined to say, let things happen. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Manu. Releasement. Releasement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I think I've already um, uh, tried to explain. It's a little bit confused, but uh, when I think of phenomenology as method, it uh, kind of also the, the premise on which I can treat phenomenology as method to look at suffering, affective states, or, or uh, something like mental illnesses that it kind of, I'm, I'm presuming that it offers a non, uh, offers something unified or offers something that is not just first personal or subjective, which is why I could use something like phenomenology as method to treat uh, or understand mental illness, but at the same time, phenomenology also as method uh, pays attention to the context or to embodiment or to intersubjectivity, uh, where I'm trying to understand the complexity of um, uh, how does the phenomenology of psychiatry or phenomenology as method take into account uh, the specificity of context or embodiment or of intersubjectivity which seem to also be central to how mental illness or illness or psychosis is experienced in different kinds of cultural contexts, let's say, or social identities. So when in your presentation, you said that um, it, for Dasein analysis, Dasein is not already a concrete subject. I wanted to, to hear more about uh, about that and also about the ontic to ontological uh, that you were talking about. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Uh, Dasein, uh, it's a very problematic concept. Moreover, because we have to translate uh, um, this philosophical framework. Today, I try to provide you a very huge and complicated philosophical framework because Heidegger was not a psychiatrist, was not a psychologist, neither a psychoanalyst. So we have to 
we have to do some yoga brain with metaphysics and ontology if we want to grasp this concept. And Dasein is a concept that can be very problematic. Let's say that it is a structure, a theoretical structure, an a priori theoretical structure of our own body, of our own gender, of our own um, neurological system, of our own bones, is a, a frame, a theoretical frame, which allows the possibility of our existence to be what it is. Of course, some interpreted raise the criticism that this view of Dasein is uh, disincarnated, is disembodied. Basically, Heidegger, it was Derrida, if I'm not wrong, uh, that used to say that Heidegger Dasein never feel, never experience the need to eat, the need to drink, the need to sleep. And it's true, because it's not an embodied agency, it's not a concrete subject, it's a theoretical frame, it's a concept. And I would say it's a compass. And we should use this compass to navigate into some kind of features and things that pertain to our life. If we open beyond time, perhaps we have the impression that Heidegger is talking about things that we do not experience in our daily life. I mean, what is this stuff? Uh, this is quite a misunderstanding because basically is explaining us uh, how our existence is a structure through which elements we can build a kind of self-interpretation of our own experience and how can we navigate to the different content we need in our daily life, in our experience. Um, of course, when we mutuated from the Degerian toolbox all this concept and we bring this concept into the empirical world, into um, a realm of things with names, with cultural background, with a certain history, with a certain social cultural identity, we, we experience a gap because on one hand, we have this framework and on the other hand, we have the concreteness of something. This is precisely what we can define as the difference between the ontological level and the ontic level as manifestations of the ontic level. And uh, this is very clear in the Zolikon seminar. So Heidegger claims that these two levels, the ontic one and the ontological one, are not detached. We, we should not uh, make the mistake to think that they are not intertwined, that they are not interrelated. They are continuously in a, a certain relationship, one with the other, that they mutually influence and illuminate one with the other. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, we got two more questions. The first would be from Paolo Evangelista himself about Vince Wanger, Franklin, Boss. So whoever is there, as Pablo would like Hello. to Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, thank you, Francesca, for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned Franco, Vince Wanger, and Boss. And there are other uh, psychiatrists who were fairly close to Heidegger. The boss was the closest. Should we consider his design analysis the, the, the finest uh, application, so to say, of Heidegger's uh, understanding of human suffering? Do you think his, his design analysis would be the, 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 the best application, I guess, of Heidegger's work? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'm not inclined to use the word best. 
I'm inclined to use the word more faithful. And now we have a problem. Until what extent do we have to be faithful to a thinker if we deal with the human facticity, with the human suffering, with illness, with a world in which we have to find meanings and not only provide a concept. So I would say that both applications of designs and analysis is still the more faithful to the Degerian project. But uh, I'm not inclined to say that it fits better in any care practices we want to reach. And at the same time, I'm, I, I, I mentioned these three guys, the Biswanger, Bos, and Frankl, because they were friends with Heidegger. And until some extent, Heidegger shared with them also his personal consideration. And despite the violent critic we read in the Zollicon seminars again against this banger, uh, at the very beginning in 1929, when a Heidegger went to Frankfurt and a Biswanger had the chance to talk with him personally, they shared a certain common sensibility, a certain interest. So each of these guys has its own peculiarity in his clinical approach. So uh, yes, for me, the most important thing is to conceive until which extent we must to be faithful to a thinker when the price to pay is the well-being of people and uh, of the possibility to, to provide uh, better clinical practices. Thank you. And then we have a question from Anders Ting. Right. The rest of your name, I'm sorry. But yeah, if you would like to show it up. And be on. Yes. Can, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear and we can see. Okay, perfect. Yeah, go on. Okay, okay. Thank you for a nice uh, presentation. I wondered um, in Solikan seminars, uh, Boss is many times hinting. Uh, Heidegger at the uh, at the, 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 the Indian traditions, and and he's also talking about um, uh, the Indian traditions have very much focus on 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 sound consciousness or, or, or Dasein being being in the world uh, by the means of sound and resonance, like you when you do so mantras and 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 stuff like that, and that's also uh, I think a big theme in Heidegger. You know all his it, it, you know, uh, truth is disclosed by stimmung, right? It's not just a, a metaphor of consciousness as light, but also a, a, of stimmung as a sound. Uh, the world is also disclosed by the means of a uh, dimension of musicality or resonance or stimmung. And, and, and I think this um, dimension uh, today, there are many, many, I, I'm a psychologist myself, and, 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 and today yoga and meditation is pretty mainstream in psychiatry and, and psychology in Denmark, at least. Uh, so many, many people work with uh, meditation, yoga, body practices. And, and in the yoga tradition, there is this uh, concept of the body as being uh, like a body of resonance, you know, the, 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 the so-called chakra systems where they, you use uh, sound and vibration to, to uh, open up contact between uh, bodies and, 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 and the body and the world. So you regulate contact with the world by the means of sound. Uh, but So uh, these themes are very, very common in all kinds of uh, the music uh, therapy, healing, and and yoga, and all this. They have this, this. Uh, they they don't use like a, a, a medical uh, understanding of the body, but they use about the body as having different centers that resonate with stimulus, with sound. So so th these these things have been known in in practical therapy. And meditation for for like in maybe 40 30 years or something like that many many people know this but still this kind of understanding of the body as resonance or having a musical dimension 
is, is still regarded as new age kind of thing. So, so we discuss these themes of, of stimmung and, and, and this disclosure by stimmung in, in, in academical circles like this, but it, 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 it's funny, a guy like me who follow the, the uh, uh, philosophical discussions, but I also uh, participate in practical training with the sound therapy and, and yoga therapy and working with contact and, 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 uh, and, 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 and stimulating in therapy, but it's like these worlds seldom talk with each other. Uh, I just wondered if you can, I don't know what the question is. I, um, it's just like, it, it seems to me like we have the understanding from Heidegger that, that this is a part of the body. We need to have an under, another understanding of the body as, as being in resonance with the world and with other bodies, but, but, but it, and, and many, many people work with this in practical therapies, but, but uh, the, the theoretical discussions and the practical work, they never meet each other. How, how come and, and what are your thoughts on this? Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Oh, wow. I do agree when, when you say that Heidegger is inviting us to, to approach to, to have a different consideration of the body. Um, and it's precisely in the surfing into the Tolikon seminars that we can do this different conception of the body. Um, but the, your remark, if I'm not wrong, is on another level. How can we bridge a gap between academics and practitioners when uh, supposedly we should speak the same language? Not at least do the same things, but speaking the same language or sharing a certain similar values, concepts, or practices. This is a challenge. This is a challenge, a real challenge, because, yes, mm, philosophers, more than half, and I used to be confined in their every tower. That's, that's the problem that Heidegger is about. Yes, exactly. And this is one of the main reasons why he accepted the invitation of Boss to, to deliver these this seminars, the Tolikon seminars. Uh, his hope was that the meditative thinking, the Besinnung, he called meditative thinking just in opposition to metaphysical education, which is at the core of um, a degree in a medic medicine and surgery, just to speak very in a very rough way. Um, it's precisely this. Do not let this thinking confine only to the ivory tower of philosophy. And if I may take a step further, let's hope that philosophy will recover its originally um, aspiration, its original uh, attitude. Philosophy was born, I'm thinking, for example, to a wonderful book of uh, Pierre Hadot uh, about uh, philosophy as uh, a spiritual exercise. Philosophy was born not as a matter of classes, not as a subject of university degree courses. It was born as a, an exercise, a spiritual exercise. How can we recover this uh, vocation of the philosophy? I think that plurality is a way to recover this. Mm -hmm. And it means to invite the philosophical community to go outside the Harbury Towers and talk with the professionals, with the people. They are doing things in the same uh, field, but with different tools, with different education. It's tough. It's very tough. Sometimes it's also complicated because um, talking to each other can be a challenge, but being a dialogue is another thing. And if we, uh, we want to be in a dialogue, we have to bracket many important things which regard each of us. And, uh, but yes, I, I agree with you. He, he's offering us from the Zolicon, we can draw a new, a new meaning of the body as something which can resonate over the other. So maybe I can just comment that in Denmark, there is a project called the Rosa 
and it takes uh, it uh, it's founded in the in the theory of Hartmut Rosa. You know Hartmut Rosa, mm -hmm. uh, book resonance. So so uh, the, it's a it's a project in psychiatry where they use the concept of resonance to, to the so the people are allowed to work with the people with the professionals where they can feel the most resonance uh, in the contact. Uh, so, so here they use a, like a phenomenological concept of, 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 of the felt resonance mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. people. So they, they can, instead of just saying, here is your therapist, they, they are allowed to say, okay, I, I don't really feel this. Uh, I don't really have this uh, experience of, of good contact of resonance here. So, so that's a small example of how they, they use like a concept of resonance, even though that you know, the doctor can't measure this resonance. They, they, they start to get a little more language that they, that they actually have some shared language that, that, that there, are, there are different levels of connections and felt resonance between people. And it's actually, uh, it's actually it can be of help that we have a language that we can uh, allow people to- Under, Sorry, but- work. We, we have to give space. Okay, 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 sorry. Sorry. It's okay. so important. Sorry. Yes, thank you. But it's, it's brilliant. The resonance. Yeah. They should introduce it across all medical specialties. I, I was uh, thinking, for example, also to Thomas Fuchs notion of bodily resonance. So is that resonance, this issue of bodily resonance from which Heidegger provides just some hints, it's a huge topic in the, in the contemporary scenario. It's so we have uh, three more questions and one comment. Uh, so I guess we'll try to fit that into the nine minutes we still got left. So first, a comment from uh, Alsat Manzanera. Would you like to uh, say it in person? Or is it just a chat comment? Yeah, hello everyone. Just uh, I just wanted like to share that small re reflection. I'm a uh, resident in psychiatry, and uh, I think that also like taking uh, in like taking an important notice of this uh, previous comment of bridging a gap. I think there's a lot of things uh, that are uh, fundamental in mental health. Is that uh, we don't uh, split the individual in this mind and body dualism sometimes. Sometimes it is like useful as a tool to talk about mind and body and sometimes it is not so uh, uh, so useful or good for the patient, so to speak. And so uh, talking about uh, uh, the design, it, I just wanted to share that it reminded me a lot of certain components in psychodynamic therapies and also an important part of acceptance and compromise therapy, which is just kind of a secularized form of Buddhism and trying translated as a way of working in, in, a, in a way of cognitive behavioral therapy and also uh, in talking about attachment, which is an important thing that uh, uh, happens in, in, since one is just one, one year old, it, it is established uh, as a, if a secure attachment is established in the child, it allows, allows him to explore freely in the world. And, and also to know how to ask for help to its caregivers. This is like a very synthesized way of speaking of this. And so uh, and how to teach this to the parents is telling them to being with that with the child, being with your own emotions, just like sit it, sit with it, right? So uh, I think that this important thing of the sign of also this kind, I don't know if it fits with a dialectical way of thinking of saying that there, there is a trust to the subjective and the objective at the same time. So you can be with your own difficulties and also meet the needs of your child. So I think philosophically uh, and how to this, the concept of the sign might connect this to other concepts and other ways of thinking uh, is an important thing of uh, making a, a better understanding of the mental health of, of human suffering and how we can help uh, each other and how we get sometimes mixed with all the clinical practice in medicine. And uh, it, it was a great talk. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. Thank you. Uh, and Stefano, I think you're next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca, for your talk. Um, it's, uh, I have, I don't know, some remarks, questions. So, well, just the first one is uh, um, you emphasize the positive value of uh, 
um, Heidegger's criticism against a reductionistic approach to human being. And you were, I had the impression you were very convinced about it. And I had the less the impression that you were very convinced about the uh, constructive potentiality of Heidegger's um, uh, contribution to mental health. As it sounds that the negative part was much more convincing in a way than the constructive one. And then my question is, do you think that there are not other paradigms which better fulfill this function? For instance, what you say about Merleau-Ponty, but I, I think uh, of an author like, about an author like Maldinet, who is uh, in between uh, Merleau-Ponty and uh, Heidegger. Uh, that's the first question. Uh, is it true? My impression, is it true? And then do you consider other thinker much better equipped, especially with regard to the relation of embodiment? You know, I think it's interesting to emphasize what you did uh, on the Zoligon seminar, but still uh, the, his analysis, uh, I, I would say it is not comparable uh, with Merleau-Ponty's uh, analysis uh, with regard to the phenomenology accuracy. So that's the first question. The second point is uh, that you say, uh, Heidegger said in the Soligon seminar, I didn't see this point in a Zynon site about the body. Um, and, uh, and then it's, I think it's interesting to consider uh, some very basic presupposition concerning the relation of mental health, psychiatry and uh, um, uh, Heidegger's philosophy uh, from a very specific perspective, from the perspective of common sense. You know, Heidegger, in a way, despised common sense. As a, there is uh, in as a Das Mann day, is, uh, and psychiatry is based on uh, Lebensfeld, on common sense. That's why, um, uh, and then the, the same architectonic, as a, the, the structure of, uh, uh, of uh, Sein und Zeit, all the dichotomy, ontological, ontic, but authentic, inauthentic. They are, um, they are based on this uh, also, you could say negative approach to common sense. That's, that's, uh, uh, for, uh, that, that's quite uh, clear. I, and you, you know that there is this, uh, um, Gnostic, Gnostic interpretation of Heidegger's philosophy, uh, Jonas, but there are uh, Taubes, uh, Taubes, there are several who think that at the end there is a kind of a allergy to the world as such. There is, uh, uh, they, that's why the Sein zum Tode is the authentic, uh, authentic moment, because in the, in, with regard to the Sein zum Tode, there is no, no contact between human being and uh, and, uh, um, and the world. And this is, I think, uh, uh, then it, it becomes very difficult if this, uh, this interpretation is right to reintroduce the notion of uh, a body uh, in a fruitful sense. Uh, it's clear uh, that's, that's in a way a polemical against Heidegger, not against you. Uh, it's also true that Heidegger they really offered a major contribution to what you said, what you already said, to the phenomenology of mood. And it's not by chance that in Zen Zeit, the first, one of the first uh, mood analyze is depression. He speaks about Verstimmung, uh, it, it's depression. And he already uh, had, uh, uh, you, you know better than me, he, he had uh, already several episodes of depression uh, when he referred to it. That's why I think the uh, there is this, uh, um, ambiguity. Um, so this is just uh, the, I don't want to now criticize the, um, the reduplication of ontological. I think I don't know it's right, but that's not, <laughs> it becomes too complex. But I just say, first question, um, is it true that my impression is right that you have, uh, uh, you share more his uh, negative, uh, his criticism, and you are a little bit more perplexed about his constructive part. It's possible that I misunderstood you, but I want to know that. Second, are there other paradigms who are better equipped with deal with this 
problem uh, with regard to embodiment and uh, um, in, within the phenomenological tradition, your view. And third, I uh, with regard this uh, architectonic of uh, Zainun site and how is it possible to combine the Tzolikon seminar with this uh, dichotomic uh, um, order, with this dichotomic uh, approach, uh, which is very essential to Zainun site. So, thank you, Stefano. I think we need uh, a coffee and two hours of talk in order to address properly your, your point, but I will do my best to do in a short time. Uh, let's start with your impression. Um, I do share both of the things. Uh, I mean, I share both of the, the strong criticism Heidegger rises against a certain way of conceiving in natural sciences. And at the same time, he shared this kind of criticism also with other thinkers I just mentioned in the presentation, Marcuse, Jonas, Jaspers, and but there are also many others. But I do believe also that the possibility of funding uh, an existential approach can be meaningful to certain kind of disease. I want to underline this point, to certain kind of disease. This is not my point of view. This is Meda the boss point of view. He says very clear in a beautiful brief, we can use the designs analyse until some extent. Then we have to use different paradigm for clinical practices. So I do share both the, um, the perspective. Uh, my main concern was time. I just was running out of time. So just the presentation was very dense because the Zolicon seminars are really dense. So, but I do share both the perspective, the negative criticism that I did raise against a certain way of conceiving natural science, and also the possibility that the science analysis, it's a strong, good therapeutic approach for some kind of pathologies. We could say for pathology of existence, which perhaps we can involve uh, depression, melancholic depression. I have some resistance to think that the science analysis can work, for example, in case of schizophrenia. Let's go to the second point. Oh, the architectonic of the side, it's very complicated. And I had the chance to, to see the personal copy of um, Martin Heidegger being some time, uh, the Hute copy, the copy that he used to have in Tonoberg. The now uh, is um, the owner of this copy is Professor von Ehmann. And I, when I visited him, uh, I had the chance to look at the book. And the book, it's full of notes and remarks. For his life, Heidegger just went back to be in time and correct and correct and correct and to correct and underline. So the architectonic of the word, of the work as we know today, of course, as, as some kind of criticism as some kind of wicked point. But I would not say, for example, that Heidegger has a problem with the um, common sense because the, the role of Dasman is not to criticize the common sense in general. The point is that the criticism to the Dasman as well as to other form of inauthenticity, in, uh, or not authenticity is precisely to distract the Dasein to answer to the call of the Augenblick, to the call of the instant that he has to address. So it's not, I don't think that it's a problem with the common sense in general. I think that uh, it's, Heidegger has a problem with the common sense in relation to the possibility to choose the most authentic way to be who you want to be. This is why the Sein zum Tode is finalized to a certain extent to, to, uh, to reduce the many possibilities that we have to choose. And your third question was, I forgot. So I, 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 I would like just, I think you, uh, you know, there is this joke, Adorno's joke, he says, uh, because Ador uh, uh, Heidegger always insists on the fact that uh, authenticity and inauthenticity is not, they do not have any reference to value. They are not. Yes, yeah. Yeah, they are value. And uh, I, uh, I don't want to say rightly, in my view, when, when Heidegger say that it has nothing to do with it, 
it has to do with it. I think there is a kind of psychoanalytical denegation. You cannot say that, the, that this, there is this kind of uh, absolute heroism of few people who are able to address the shiksal, the destiny, and to look vis-a-vis uh, -vis the death and all the other live inauthentically. And then to say there is no ethical reference. I, in, in English, you could say, I don't buy it. It's clear that how you present you, the, the choice of the terminology have a great impact, also affective impact. They refer to a tradition. He refers to Augenblick, he's a, a Kierkegaard. That's why I would say, mm, I don't, uh, I don't, I think there is a value, but that's another, we can speak about it in the, in the future. And the third question was, but I don't know, I, I think we don't, we run out of time. I think it's better to conclude. We'll speak later about it. Okay. Sorry for the too long question. No, we, we run out of time, but let's, uh, we'll finish in two minutes, but just, uh, I don't want to cut people who already asked the questions uh, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. So just quickly and briefly, if you could, Francesca, uh, Rui Zhang is Rui Zhang here and would like to ask in person, what is the quantity of being in Heidegger's concept? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Is Rui Zhang here? Uh, hi, yes, I'm here. And I just yeah. heard this from at, at the beginning of Francisca's presentation. Uh, I don't think I understand it either. So I just took this opportunity to ask if you could be so kind to briefly explain to me. Yes. Sentence. Thanks. Yes, I would do my best. Thank you for your question. Uh, basically, uh, perhaps you are referring to a certain point of my presentation when I was addressing Heidegger's critic of natural sciences, according to which natural sciences is grounded on the paradigm of measurability. And numbers are the measure of truth, according to a certain way of exercising sciences. And uh, the point is that for Heidegger, it's not the quantity, the principle of truth, rather is the quality. And the quality, we can reach the quality not through measurement, but rather to get in confrontation, to use a, a language very detached from Heidegger jargon, um, to get in dialogue with the content of our own experience. So the issue of quantity of beings has to do with the principle of measurement or with the conception of technology, with the fact that human being uh, um, has the power to, to measure, to calculate, to manipulate nature and to have uh, at his own disposal nature until uh, the resources will hand. So uh, it was in light of Heidegger criticism to, to science and to technology. Thank you. And the last comment is, I think it's more like a comment or two comments from Rosita Christo Fidelli. Yes, hello. Uh, Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Yes, I try to to give, um, you know, somehow as a design analyst, I'm try I try to to give uh, two points uh, on the, on the comments. Uh, one was uh, about the uh, design analysis and the fact that it's a non goal oriented uh, psychotherapy. So uh, this is why uh, any technique could be utilized and none. Uh, at the same moment. So somehow uh, what uh, somebody was saying about uh, meditation and uh, the sounds and music, a a anything could be relevant and irrelevant at, at, in some extent in design analysis. So yes, being a, uh, a good design analyst, let's say, uh, means not to be a fanatic one, uh, means to be able to think in any uh, way that could serve the moment uh, within the psychotherapeutic uh, session. Uh, and, uh, and somehow about uh, the common sense, I would say that uh, being able to, to, to make sense, to, 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 to find a meaning in, in life is far more important than uh, finding a, an objective meaning uh, and being uh, able to, um, 
to accept some kind of common sense. This is what I wanted to add to the conversation. And thank you very, very much for this lovely uh, presentation. Thank you for your remarks. I find important that uh, a therapist with a clear vocation of the design analytic approach can say your, is your word, because uh, as a philosopher, I cannot, I cannot serve into a certain domain, not only because I don't have the competences, but also because uh, my job is different. So uh, this was one of my more beautiful hope that today someone from the designs analytic field could be here and exchange the point of view of someone who practice this instead of someone who just is here to explain uh, the contest. So I thank you very much for your remarks. Really useful for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And th thank thanks to everyone for the creative input to this uh, seminar and, uh, uh, and mostly to Francesca who, who gave a wonderful talk. And uh, well, we're looking forward uh, to, to, to continue this discussion, but uh, not uh, now we, we got to go. Uh, so hope to see you uh, next time, next month. Uh, during the next seminar and again many thanks Francesca for, for being here. It was uh, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you thank for you, the Francesca, invitation for... and for the passion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. For well, and have a, a good afternoon or morning or evening depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, I hope to see you next time. All the best. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.